The more a country develops, the more meat its inhabitants consume. How can growing worldwide demand be satisfied without recourse to concentration camp style cattle farms? Faster and faster, like the life cycle of livestock which may never see a meadow, manufacturing meat faster than the animal has become a daily routine. In these vast food lots trampled by millions of cattle, not a blade of grass grows. A fleet of trucks from every corner of the country brings in tons of grain, soy meal, and protein-rich granules that will become tons of meat. The result is that it takes 100 liters of water to produce one kilogram of potatoes, 4,000 liters for one kilo of rice, and 13,000 liters for one kilo of beef. Not to mention the oil guzzled in the production process and transport. By far and away, the biggest factor in terms of this mass extinction is destroying natural habitat or converting natural habitat into land for food. The more dependent we are on meat, milk, and eggs, the greater the CO2 and methane emissions. Cattle and ruminants of all kinds produce methane as a byproduct of breaking down grass and other things that they feed on. So the contractions are pushing this gas out from the stomach going through here in the one-way valve. Yes, and into after the bag. this, we collect inside the bag. So how long has that bag been collecting gas? For? Only two hours. Methane is something like 22 times more potent as a climate-changing gas than is CO2. So it doesn't take very much methane to make a difference. A cow can basically fill up a 55-gallon garbage bag full of methane every day. One cow is not a problem, but now we have 1.5 billion of them. And it's an incredibly inefficient way of producing food. Three quarters of agricultural land is used just to feed livestock. When you factor in everything, the clearing of the land for grazing, feeding, transporting, Livestock causes more greenhouse gases than all the direct emissions from the entire transportation sector. India risks being the country that suffers most from the lack of water in the coming century. Massive irrigation has fed the growing population and in the last 50 years, 21 million wells have been dug. In many parts of the country, the drill has to sink ever deeper to hit water. In Western India, 30% of wells have been abandoned. The underground aquifers are drying out. Vast reservoirs will catch the monsoon rains to replenish the aquifers. In dry season, women from local villages dig them with their bare hands. Union uses about 1,500 gallons per person per day. Um, about half of that is related to the consumption of meat and dairy products. So meat and dairy products are incredibly water intensive, um, in part because the animals are using very water intensive grains. That's what they, they eat. Um, and so all of the water embedded in, in the grain and that the animal eats essentially is, is considered part of the virtual water footprint of that product. I found out that one quarter pound hamburger requires over 660 gallons of water to produce. Here I've been taking these short showers trying to save water and to find out just eating one hamburger is the equivalent of showering two entire months. So much attention is given to lowering our home water use, yet domestic water use is only 5% of what is consumed in the U.S. versus 55% for animal agriculture. That's because it takes upwards of 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. 
I went on the government's Department of Water Resources Save Our Water campaign, where it outlines behavior changes to help conserve our water, like using low-flow shower heads, efficient toilets, water-saving appliances, and fix leaky faucets and sprinkler heads, but nothing about animal agriculture. When I added up all the government's recommendations, I was saving 47 gallons a day. But still, that's not even close to the 660 gallons of water for just one burger. All living matter is linked. Water, air, soil, trees. The world's magic is right in front of our eyes. Trees breathe groundwater into the atmosphere as light mist. They form a canopy that alleviates the impact of heavy rains. The forests provide the humidity that is necessary for life. They store carbon, containing more than all the Earth's atmosphere. They are the cornerstone of the climactic balance on which we all depend. The trees of the primary forests provide a habitat for three quarters of the planet's biodiversity. That's to say, of all life on Earth. These forests provide the remedies that cure us. The substances secreted by these plants can be recognized by our bodies. Our cells talk the same language. We are of the same family. But in barely 40 years, the world's largest rainforest, the Amazon, has been reduced by 20%. The forest gives way to cattle ranches or soybean farms. 95% of these soybeans are used to feed livestock and poultry in Europe and Asia. And so a forest is turned into meat. Barely 20 years ago, Borneo, the fourth largest island in the world, was covered by a vast primary forest. At the current rate of deforestation, it will have totally disappeared within 10 years. Living matter bonds water, air, earth, and the sun. In Borneo, this bond has been broken in what was one of the Earth's greatest reservoirs of biodiversity. Carry the burden of nine billion human beings if we refuse to be called to account for everything we alone have done.
I was beyond frightened to imagine what could possibly happen if I pursued this subject any further. It seemed the only decision to make was to put down the cameras and walk away. But then, I realized this issue was way bigger than any personal concern I could ever have for myself. This was about all life on Earth hanging in the balance of our actions. Now you either live for something or die for nothing. And I actually had no choice all along. I decided then to surrender not to fear from a secret, but rather to a cause towards truth. I couldn't be like these environmental organizations and sit silently while the planet was being eaten alive right in front of our eyes. I had to stand up and continue on. Some people would say the problem isn't really animal agriculture, but actually human overpopulation. In 1812, there are 1 billion people on the planet. In 1912, there are 1.5 billion. Then, just 100 years later, our population exploded to 7 billion humans. This number is rightly given a great deal of attention, but an even more important figure when determining world population is the world's 70 billion farm animals humans raise. The human population drinks 5.2 billion gallons of water every day and eats 21 billion pounds of food. But just the world's 1.5 billion cows alone drink 45 billion gallons of water every day and eat 135 billion pounds of food. This isn't so much a human population issue, it's a human eating animals population issue. Environmental organizations not addressing this is like health organizations trying to stop lung cancer without addressing cigarette smoking. But instead of secondhand smoking, it's secondhand eating, which affects the entire planet. We're growing enough food right now in, in the world to feed between 12 and 15 billion people. We only have 7 billion people. We have roughly a billion people starving every single day. Worldwide, 50% of the grain and legumes that we're growing we're feeding to animals. So they're eating huge amounts of grain and legumes. And in the United States, it's more like closer to 70, 80, depending on which grain it is, 90, about 90% 90 of the soybeans. 82% of the world's starving children 
live in countries where food is fed to animals in the livestock systems that are then killed and eaten by more well-off individuals in developed countries such as the US, UK, and in Europe. The fact of it is that we could feed every human being on the planet today an adequate diet if we did no more than take the, the feed that we are feeding to animals and actually turn it into food for humans. But what if people just ate less animal products, like going meatless on Mondays? When you go meatless on Monday, if you ascribe to that campaign, you're essentially contributing to climate change, pollution, depletion of our planet's resources and your own health than on only six days of the week instead of seven. Uh, you're creating a false justification clearly a false sense of uh, justification for what you're doing on those other six days of the week. So in other words, you know, we really shouldn't be resting on our laurels of what you do right uh, only one-seventh of the time. You can't be an environmentalist and eat animal products, period. Kid yourself if you want. If you want to feed your addiction, so be it. But don't call yourself an environmentalist. I knew I had to stop eating all animal products. I wanted to help the planet be sustainable, but I needed to sustain myself. I had doubts about being healthy and not eating meat, dairy, and eggs. All I knew was a standard American diet I grew up on. Um, is it even possible to be a healthy vegetarian or vegan? Is it possible to be a healthy vegetarian or vegan? Uh, I became vegan for, let's see, 32 years ago now. And uh, I run several miles every day. I, I go biking 40, 50 miles through the countryside. I work long hours. Um, I feel great. It's nice waking up in a light, trim body every day. And so many of my vegan friends and patients, you know, are just, you know, they're thriving uh, since their transition to a vegan diet. So, yes, and I've seen vegan moms go through healthy vegan pregnancies and deliver healthy vegan children and raise them to tall, full-size, intelligent vegan adults. And, yes, um, it, certainly all, all the nutrients are there in the plant kingdom to do this. Uh, that is correct. I think anyone should be uh, consuming dairy? I really don't. Uh, when you think about it, the purpose of cow's milk, I did most of my growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, the purpose of cow's milk is to turn a 65 pound calf into a 400 pound cow as rapidly as possible. Cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. That's what this stuff is. <clears throat> Everything in that white liquid the hormones, the lipids, the proteins, the sodium, the growth factors, the IGF, all, every one of those is meant to blow that calf up to a great big cow. It wouldn't be there. And whether you pour it on your cereal as a liquid, whether you clot it into yogurt, whether you eat it into cheese, whether you freeze it into ice cream, it's baby calf growth fluid and women eat it and it stimulates their tissues and it gives women breast lumps. It makes the uterus get big and they get fibroids and they bleed and they get hysterectomies and they need mammograms and, and gives guys man boobs. This is cow's milk is the lactation secretions of a large bovine mammal who just had a baby. It's for baby calves. You know, I tell my patient, go look in the mirror. Do you have big ears? Do you have a tail? Are you a baby calf? If you're not, don't be eating baby calf growth fluid in, uh, in any level. There's nothing in it people need. It was a relief to hear I didn't have to eat any animal products to be healthy and even thrive. And the World Bank released an analysis on human-induced greenhouse gases, finding that animal agriculture was responsible not for 18%, as the UN stated, but was actually 51% of all greenhouse gases. 51%. Yet all we hear about is burning fossil fuels. This devastating figure is due to clear-cutting rainforest for grazing, respiration, and all the waste animals produced. This makes animal agriculture the number one contributor to human-caused climate change. But not only that, I found out raising animals for food consumes a third of all the planet's fresh water, occupies up to 45% of the Earth's land, is responsible for up to 91% of Amazon destruction, is a leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, and habitat destruction. Yet, the world's largest environmental groups that are supposed to be saving vegan diet for a year requires just one-sixth of an acre of land. To feed that same person on a vegetarian diet that includes eggs and dairy requires three times as much land.
To feed an average U.S. citizen's high-consumption diet of meat, dairy, and eggs requires 18 times as much land. This is because you can produce 37,000 pounds of vegetables on one and a half acres, but only 375 pounds of meat on that same plot of land. I also learned the comparison doesn't end with land use. A vegan diet produces half as much CO2 as an American omnivore, uses 1 11th the amount of fossil fuels, 1 13th the amount of water, and an 18th of the amount of land. After adding this all up, I realized I had the choice every single day to save over 1,100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 30 square feet of forested land, the equivalent of 20 pounds of CO2, and one animal's life every single day. If we all as a society did go vegan and we moved away from eating animal foods and toward a plant-based diet, well, what would happen? If we didn't kill all these cows and eat them, then we wouldn't have to breed all these cows because we're breeding cows and chickens and pigs and fishes. We're breeding them and, you know, over and over again relentlessly. So if we didn't breed them, then we wouldn't have to feed them. If we didn't have to feed them, then we wouldn't have to devote all this land to growing grains and legumes and so forth to feed to them. And so the, then the forest could come back, uh, wildlife could come back, the oceans would come back, the rivers would run clean again, the air would come back, uh, health would return. Renewable energy infrastructure, such as building solar and wind generators all over our country to reduce climate change, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good idea, but it's projected to take at least 20 years and at least minimally $18 trillion to develop. You know, it's important to, to realize that we, we don't have that long of a time frame. We just talked about how it might be a three to four year time frame. So we don't really have 20 years and we really don't have $18 trillion to develop these. So, so um, another solution to climate change, we could, we could stop eating animals. And it could be done today. It doesn't have to take uh, 20 years and it certainly doesn't have to take $18 trillion because it costs nothing. Some people say, well, let's fix CO2 and then we can worry about the methane. Well, that's the wrong, it's the other way around. It actually makes sense. Do something about methane because you get a response right away. Quietly and unmistakably, the most powerful thing that someone can do for the environment. Um, no other lifestyle choice has a farther reaching and more profoundly positive impact on the planet and all life on Earth than choosing to, to stop consuming animals and live a vegan lifestyle. Do you realize 75% of Americans consider themselves to be environmentalists. You don't think we couldn't solve this problem in a heartbeat? I'll tell you what, all we would need is for the environmentalists to live what they profess, and we'd be on a new course in the world. We will not succeed until we stop animal agriculture. And by succeed, I mean we will not save ecosystems to the extent necessary. We will not have enough food for people around the planet. We will not stop global warming. We will not stop pollution and the dead zones that run off all the fields of corn and soy that are grown to feed livestock. And we will not stop the, the hunting of wolves and other predators. Now, organic farming is one major positive step in the right direction, but we need to keep walking. We need to get beyond organics. We need to get to sustainability. When you take the animal out, well, you also take the greenhouse gas issue out. And you take the food safety issues out. And you take some of the other externalities related to food scarcity out. But one thing that's amazing is, I think you put our values back in. You put values like compassion and integrity and kindness, values that are natural to human beings. You put that in, you build that back into the story of our food. And I think as this begins to progress, I think it also helps people to pause before they eat that egg, before they eat that steak, before they eat that chicken nugget, and ask themselves, is that really what they want? Or do they actually want something more? I had to come to the full conclusion, the only way to sustainably and ethically live on this planet with 7 billion other people is to live an entirely plant-based vegan diet. I decided instead of eating others, to eat for others. At first, like these environmental groups, I was afraid of what it'd mean to change, but now I embrace it. All this talk about sustainability sounded like our planet was on some sort of life support, and I don't want her to simply survive or to sustain, but to thrive. Life today is not about sustainability. It's about thrivability. She's given so much to us for so long, it was time to give back. 
108% of everything we have. It felt good. It was in alignment. And we see this movement not just about providing cheaper and expensive food that everyone can have, but also a spiritual move, a move towards understanding who we really are and how we can really connect to each other. Do what you can do as well as you can do it every day of your life, and you will end up dying one of the happiest individuals that ever, ever died. Human scale, it can feed the whole planet if meat production doesn't take the food out of people's mouths.